Okay, well, I make that the hour, so I think we'll get started. Hello, uh, and welcome to today's Twist Hosted uh, webinar, Drugging the Undruggable with Protein Interference. My name's Chris Thorne. Uh, I'm Senior Manager for Field Marketing here at Twist. Before we get into the webinar, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. As you've noticed, all of your microphones are muted and will be for the duration of the webinar. But if you do have questions, please submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen rather than using the chat window. And this just allows us to uh, see what's coming in and make sure your questions get answered. Following the webinar, um, if you have a moment, we will be sending you to a short survey. And we'd be very grateful if you could just take one minute or less to just give us some feedback and let us know how we're doing and what you uh, enjoyed uh, from this particular presentation. Right, so since the discovery of RNAi in 1998, we've seen leaps forward in how scientists are screening for promising potential drug targets using approaches that link the modulation of a gene or a protein to a disease phenotype. And I'm really excited today to be joined by an expert in this particular space, uh, and that is Ben Cross, who is the CTO at Foremost in Cambridge, UK. Ben joined Foremost in 2019 to direct the evolution and development of the SightSeeker screening platform there. And before joining Foremost, Ben founded Horizon Discovery's functional genomic screening platform using pooled and arrayed approaches and both RNAi and CRISPR, ultimately leading to a group that was executing hundreds of screens per year. Okay, so Ben, uh, I'd like to hand over to you now uh, and, and I'll let you take it from here. A lot, Chris, uh, for that nice introduction. And thanks a lot also um, for the opportunity from Twist to present our work uh, to you today. Um, we're gonna to talk to you about protein I um, and how it pertains to the undruggable problem. But first of all, a note on that problem, the scale of it. There's estimated to be around 4,000 uh, known drug targets, um, but only about a quarter of those are currently successfully adequately drugged. And uh, if that wasn't a big enough problem, there's obviously also a tiny fraction, even if they were all successfully drugged, of the known proteome, both human and pathogenic, and adding even further complexity when we start to think about the possibilities for targeting protein-protein interactions. So there is clearly this vast opportunity in drug target development um, and something that we're hoping to capitalize on. Now, there are lots of technologies um, with AI and CRISPR uh, making huge bounds and lots of headlines to try and tackle some of these aspects. But one of the sort of features of, of, of many of these campaigns is that target ID, if I can just get this to move on, generally speaking, starts with some sort of screen, a perturbation-based screen, for example. Um, and this is, this is a technology which is often very powerful, very predictable, and extremely valuable for many, many aspects, but what is ultimately delivered by some sort of perturbation screen for discovering a new target in some disease area is a list, a straightforward list of potential new hits or targets, things to chase up and develop drugs against. Now at that point, scientists have to make a, a pragmatic decision about how to triage these things, and it has to be based on biology and feasibility. And what often happens, uh, more often than not, is that the things that come out of any given screen with, with you know, potentially unbiased uh, uh, potential for discovering things, um, is that the things that are chased up tend to be the things we already knew about, things which are relatively easy to drug, uh, some predictable uh, aspects of them as well, and the biology is associated with them is also tractable in some way. So the outcome is cycling around this known druggable space and failing to break out of it in a way which the screen ultimately possibly could have done. And it's not, a, it's not a criticism as such, it's a, it's a feature of how scientists have to work, us included. But what we really need, collectively as a field and at Foremost, and, and thought, luckily we have, is a screening technology that delivers not only targets, but also the means to drug those targets, so that you can strip away these barriers and start to approach the, the undruggable problem in a systematic way. So protein I is something that we believe is able to do that, and I'm gonna try and demonstrate that to you today. Um, what is protein I, first of all? So protein I is, uh, is, uh, describes really a peptide fragment library, um, a vastly complex peptide fragment library, uh, carefully programmed and curated, which is expressed in the context of a live cell, highly physiological disease model. And what we're looking for uh, protein I to be doing is creating and presenting uh, novel shapes of a highly, uh, high degree of diversity uh, and to expose cells to them in, in suitable conditions so that they can start to interrogate and interfere with disease function and, and cell biology. Um, the complexity created by our protein I libraries, as, and I'll go on to explain what they are, 
is, is extremely compelling. And it allows us to explore um, in a really almost hyper unbiased fashion uh, the, the, the potential for discovering new targets. That live cell system is crucial, of course, also because we have the opportunity to better model disease physiology and discover things which are truly relevant. And what is delivered by a protein eye screen is actually a, a number of different opportunities. So of course we can discover new targets because we can find out what these peptides are binding to in order to drive cells to the desired phenotype. But we can also, as I intimated earlier, discover simultaneously the means to drug those targets, either directly in, in catalytic sites, allosterically, or indeed in novel cryptic pockets that would otherwise be un, un, undiscovered. And crucially for us, I think in particular, it also gives us the opportunity to survey interfering with protein protein interactions, creating this huge additional opportunity and massive degrees of complexity to be explored in disease uh, uh, propagation. So how do these screens work? Um, um, they are a pool system, much like CRISPR and shRNA in some regards, in so much as one starts with a library of some kind. And this is where twists come in. Uh, we are uh, happy enough can benefit from twists libraries in this regard. Um, but they're programmed and carefully curated, as I said, by us. And we use a massively parallel synthesis process to derive these oligos, turn them into plasmids in a mixed population, and ultimately then convert those into a lentivirus reagent. It is a mixed reagent, um, and it is applied to cells in a mixed form. So that what is generated is a, is, a, is a polygenic population, a mixed population of cells, all of each individually expressing a single uh, unique protein I that we can start to survey the effect, the effect of. These are sorted or, or, or analyzed by a phenotypic system, either by looking at the ability of those protein I to affect the cell's growth poten uh, potential or directly by analyzing some aspect of cell biology, which is marked by a clear phenotype, either with a reporter system or by something which is compatible with high throughput flow cytometry, such that we can physically separate populations of one phenotype or another, so a disease phenotype and a rescue phenotype, for example, and then individually deep sequence those populations to identify the barcodes that, um, that we need to find. Those barcodes mark the protein eyes directly, and we can survey then for the ability of these individual protein eyes to affect uh, the disease progression or the therapeutic intervention that we're hoping to discover. And that's a very high throughput, very highly quantitative uh, technology, which allows us to find these novel protein I. But Foremost is a company that is, uh, has high ambitions to discover not just protein I, but also drugs uh, and really develop things which can make a real big impact in the clinic. And whilst the peptides themselves have a high degree of potential, I guess, for drug ability uh, or drug-like function, uh, better described as, um, we nevertheless also recognize that there are some advantages to moving to chemical matter. And this is a process which is encapsulated by our full um, stream of activities and described on this slide here, where we start with the screen, which is what we call the site seeker process. Uh, we then subsequently have to identify the individual targets with which those protein I are, are enacting their effect. And that's a process we call site secure. There we use many different technologies from aspect biochemistry. U2 hybrid is proven quite successful for us. And also perturbation based screening here as well can be very powerful. And ultimately, once we've identified that target, we can then move on to developing the chemical matter. And here's a really important part about protein I, which I should mention, that not only does um, a protein I screen deliver you a potential target, as described there, but it also gives you this assay to discover the subsequent chemical matter. So the mapping of the protein I to the target interaction surface itself describes both the assay and the thing that you need to interrogate at the molecular detailed level uh, to develop your small molecule chemistry. Here we do this with DNA encoded libraries, with virtual screening, structural based to guided design, and all sorts of other technologies. And we're highly collaborative in this space as well, with lots of ongoing partnerships with, um, with local and international groups as well. Now I'm going to describe this process in its entirety to you with a couple of examples uh, as, the, as the discussion goes on. But first of all, um, to, to dwell a little bit on the libraries. So as I mentioned, these are libraries which we program, we curate and, and encode them ourselves. And so we have full control over what we're going to try and express in cells and what protein I sequences we're going to use. Broadly speaking, we split our libraries into two classifications, high diversity libraries and more focused functionally derived libraries. The high diversity libraries are what we have the, the maximum degree of complexity in. Here we are trying to explore um, as much different shape um, potential as possible using the protein I. And we use proteome sequences to inform this. We use those protein sequences because we reason uh, with, with hopefully good, uh, uh, good evidence, as I'll show you, that proteomes are already evolutionarily enriched for functional sequences. 
uh, over a million years of development, each individual proteome has created the likelihood for sequences to present a functional shape of some sort to something to be folded adequately, to be stable, to be expressed, and then ultimately to be available as a shape three-dimensionally to interrogate uh, biological function. We have a number of these different libraries available already that we've designed, but actually for the most part, we pool these into what we call a super pool and screen them simultaneously in a very, very high complexity screen. In other uh, experiments, we often then use functionally derived libraries. These are also sometimes I'll refer to these high resolution libraries, and there are various different formats of them. I'm gonna focus on two of these in particular today. Um, and they allow us the opportunity to not just explore um, total levels of, of, of unbiased screening, but also pathway specific analysis. So where we know enough about the biology to be able to explore uh, known nodes of, of function directly, we can design libraries that selectively and, and in, a, in a very enriched fashion, uh, explore that biological process. And we tend to do that with a very high density of protein I tiling along a given protein, a protein sequence to try and maximize the likelihood for presenting a, uh, um, a, a protein I which has some phenotypic effect. So the final thing I'll, I'll talk about on the library, which I'll come to in more detail, is, is what we call Degrapex, which is an, a mechanism for exploring the novel development of PROTAC, and I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about that today. So what do we use uh, protein I and the SiteSeeker platform for? Well, actually, we can use it for all sorts of different uh, functions. We have a, a, a high degree of um, expertise in mostly oncology, immune oncology, and, and growing in neurodegeneration. Um, but actually, the exciting thing about protein I is it can be applied far more widely than that. Really what you need to be able to benefit from protein I is um, you need a cell system which adequately uh, mimics or simulates the disease that is compatible with poor screening, screening systems. And you need a reporter of some sort so you can measure that. And if you have those two things and they are uh, suitable for the scale at which we do our experiments, which is, is pretty high, then actually we can apply um, this technology to all sorts of different, tech, uh, all sorts of different disease areas. And we're looking to do that in, and growing out in strategic ways to try and benefit from that ourselves. So one final application before I move on to some data um, that we're really excited about foremost is uh, how we can start to, um, I, I guess, uh, benefit from huge amounts of data being uh, extracted from CRISPR screening campaigns. Uh, having done many of these myself, I'm aware that they can deliver extremely compelling targets, but that actually many of those targets which are delivered by a CRISPR-based screen could fall into this uh, undruggable category. And those are targets which are often abandoned for the reasons I've described earlier, left on the cutting room floor of the screening process. Uh, and we think that there's an opportunity here for protein I to rescue those uh, hits. And the way that would be done, but it would be using one of these protein I high res screens. We would take uh, the undruggable hits from uh, any given screening campaign and design libraries that derive from the interactome of those uh, individual hits. That allows us to selectively enrich for sequences which are likely to interfere physically and functionally with the targets that are presented in the gene-centric screen. And by doing that, we think we can probably start to discover druggability within that undruggable space um, using the hits that derive from that screen and rescue those otherwise abandoned targets. So that's something we're actively working on ourselves and are looking to try and demonstrate that um, uh, in a systematic fashion. So now to some data. I wanted to discuss um, two main things today um, that I think is exciting and, and hopefully you'll, you'll agree. The first is a, is a case study which takes us all the way through the whole SiteSeeker process through to, to the small molecule uh, development. And this is in the KRAS space. So KRAS is uh, you know, the prototypical undruggable target. Uh, and so that's where we started. And a lot of our emphasis early on was in trying to interfere with this pathway, which is uh, such a known and classical uh, oncogene and, and, and a process which would be the golden, the holy, the holy grail, I guess, of undruggability. And the way we approached this was to do what we call an isogenic system or maybe a paraisogenic screen where we could induce the expression of a mutant form of KRAS in the cell system that we were um, able to control. On doing so, we introduced a, a high diversity um, uh, protein I library into each of, the, each of these parallel tracks for induced and uninduced uh, KRAS mutant forms and looked for protein I which could selectively kill the mutant KRAS cells. This was the site seeker process as I described it and it delivered uh, some hits that we were able to then start to build out our drug discovery programs on. The next stage of the process for us is this site secure process. This is effectively target ID. What is the, 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 the novel protein I that we've identified? In this case, we call it RAS002 or PM002. What does it bind to and how is it enacting its, uh, its, its, uh, its phenotype? Um, and we did this in this case by yeast 2 hybrid uh, and that provided a really compelling data set, 
not least because it delivered two paralogs um, of, the, of, um, of, uh, of proteins which were binding directly to this protein I sequence in the same region, uh, in a domain that was known to be critical for the oncogenes, those paralogs function. These, these are targets uh, that were never found by RNAi or CRISPR, which is a really interesting feature of protein I, not just because of the uniqueness of targets that they discover, but because it's possible that this was driven by some degree of polypharmacology. That is to say that the protein I may be interfering with the function of both of these uh, paralogs simultaneously and consequently driving the, the requisite phenotype uh, via simultaneous inhibition. So that's obviously something that couldn't be replicated by a gene-centric approach. The target validation uh, shown using shRNA on the right-hand side uh, revealed that the silencing of these uh, components was sufficient to derive some degree of sensitivity to, K to mutant KRAS. So confidence inducing and, and dual silencing, of course, had a, an even more profound effect. So this was a really exciting observation for us and, and a good um, demonstration that protein I is able to discover not just novel targets, but targets which can be uh, well validated directly through a novel function uh, previously unascribed to them. The, the conversion of those targets and that protein I sequence that we've identified in the screen to chemical matter is also ongoing and really progressing quite nicely. Here we were enabled by existing uh, structural data, several NMR data sets, which could describe the, both the target and the, and, the, and the groove that we were interested in, in designing drugs to via the protein I binding. And again, another feature, as I've, I've already mentioned, what is delivered by protein I is not just the target and the protein I, the potential drug, but at the very least an assay for discovering small molecules. So a really important head start in the conversion to chemical matter. The other interesting thing is that they are peptide sequences. So we can, com we can uh, conduct a very rapid, highly detailed SAR using both canonical and non-canonical amino acids uh, in a systematic fashion to optimize and improve. And frequently that is what we see. So unlike um, CRISPR-based technology, for example, which deliver extremely compelling hits um, that often then cannot be necessarily recapitulated by a drug which targets the same gene, protein I you usually start from a, a lower efficiency effectively, and you can improve that phenotype by systematic SAR analysis and mutagenesis so that you can actually get a better window for activity by maturing the peptide sequences. In this case, we used the peptide to design um, a virtual screen and that delivered a thousand or so compounds, which in the wet lab gave us about a 5% hit rate. So a pretty good overall response. Some of these with emerging cellular activity as well uh, and a good window of activity selected for uh, KRAS mutant form to the, of the model system. So that's a really good, I hope anyway, demonstration of the process from start to finish. Um, the site seeker to site secure all the way through to site block. But what I wanted to also dwell on today is something that we've been working on quite extensively over the last 18 months or so, which is the application of the site seeker and protein eye technology to uh, developing Protax. And Protax represents something really unique, not just for us, but for the drug community in general, uh, in that they have a, a really exciting opportunity using this technology to really uh, go against previously undruggable targets. So of course, we're very excited about that. Also intuitively obvious, I hope, that we've demonstrated that we can uh, discover novel warheads. Now, protact molecule is a heterobifunctional molecule, one side of which is a warhead, but the other side of which is an E3 uh, ligase recruiting uh, motif, um, uh, uh, or a ligand, if you like. And that um, combination of, of activities is what drives the, the function of a protac as it drives the, the targeted uh, protein degradation of the, of the given therapeutic target. And of course, if we can discover warheads, we reason there's a good chance that we can discover ligands against E3 ligases as well. And that's exactly what we did. We conducted a systematic primary screen based on um, a, a ligase, an E3 ligase interactome, and discovered a, a really extraordinary number of potential novel E3 ligands. Um, this is summarized on this slide. Um, the benefits of what we're trying to uncover here, of course, is the, 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 the presentation of a toolkit of novel E3 ligands. The field in the Protax space is limited to only a handful, two or three really, of, of frequently ligand E3s despite there being over 693 ligases. So we want to try and create for the field and for us um, a huge toolkit, a new tranche of, of potential novel E3s and ligands of them that could be used in Protax um, development. So what we got was, was um, as I said, hundreds of novel hits. Many of these have been validated one by one, but actually we had too many to do this in an array system. So we moved to uh, what I want to present to you today, which is a, a high throughput mechanism for validating our protein I and maturing them in a systematic fashion. So the data, uh, it derives from what we call massively parallel pooled SAR. So here again, we rely on novel library synthesis and we, uh, we, can, we can depend on Twist to provide those, um, uh, those libraries for us at the moment. Um, 
we require high fidelity sequences because there's a high degree of overlap in what we're using here. Because what we're asking for the synthesis to be able to do is to produce um, closely related sequences with high fidelity. Because in each case of uh, a hit from the screen, what we want to do is systematically mutagenize it to introduce, say, alanine mutations, as described in the graphic here, or truncations that can allow us to, to shrink the peptide motif uh, systematically. And because those sequences overlap, we require a high degree of uh, quality uh, to be able to actually interrogate that with enough, um, with enough confidence. So having taken the lead hits, designed uh, mutagenized libraries or, or SAR libraries, if you like, to try to qualify those hits and mature them and understand how active they were. We then conducted a secondary screening analysis uh, in a quasi-quantitative fashion. So without going into too much detail here, what we're asking the, the, the system to do is these novel peptide ligands are going into cells. Uh, they're causing a degradation of a reported cell system. And we're, we're, we're monitoring that degradation by flow cytometry. So we're collecting populations off the flow cytometer, as indicated in this graphic here in the secondary screen, and identifying which individual protein I sequences are, have the highest propensity to degrade the, uh, in this particular cell system. We took those hits and started to explore them, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm going to present some of that data to you today in, uh, in some detail. So the first observation we made when we took these protein I sequences, which were uh, novel ligands of E3 ligase, as a reminder, and we looked to see whether or not we could identify any improvements. So I indicated earlier that the starting point of a protein I screen delivers a protein I sequence which can actually be matured and improved over and above its initial observation. And here's an example of exactly that. So this middle data point describes the data derived from a single protein I sequence shown in a reference bar on the right hand side. And each different colored um, uh, data set, or data point rather, describes a, a mutagenesis event. So in pink, you've got alanine substitutions. This is alanine scanning throughout the sequence, in this case of an 11 mer protein I sequence. And what's shown highlighted in the middle is three residues that when you mutate them to uh, an alanine, you get an amplification of the propensity to degrade uh, the reported cells in the, the reporter in the system. And that gives us an indication that we've identified an improvement or an, an enhanced degradation potential in the hits. So that's really exciting for us to see and justifies our, our, our next step, which is a much more rationally uh, programmed set of mutagenesis events where we can start to systematically uh, explore SAR in a much more detailed fashion using targeting residue substitutions and really drive the optimization of these, uh, of these novel E3 ligands uh, in a high throughput fashion. So a couple of other exciting observations for us, not just applied to this notion around protax development, but also more generally for the, 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 the ability of the, the, the Protein I and SiteSeeker platform to deliver novel um, warheads as well. Here's an example of where we've been able to take a sequence of a protein I and miniaturize it. And this is really important because although the peptides themselves can be used as, as potential drugs with uh, viral delivery and other, other, other approaches, that, that conversion to chemical matter is also something we're really excited by. But to convert a peptide sequence into a, a small molecule, you really need to get down to the four and five amino acids long uh, so you can mimic the small molecule chemistry that you'll need to develop. So here what we're identifying is these minimal motifs. And you can see in the data, for example, here, uh, focusing on these blue bars where we, the, we're looking at truncations. So these are shortened forms of the original peptide that was discovered in the screen. And in this case, what they described is activation, which is either maintained or partially maintained, even despite the truncation. So that describes a minimal motif, which is, uh, is sufficient to drive the activity of that protein I, in this case, in, the, in providing an E3 ligand or a degradation potential. And in the table, we describe a number of these which we've identified, which are minimal motifs of sequences which, dis which have the, the same degree of activity. And these will allow us to transition to site block in a much more systematic and, and fast fashion because we've, we've been able to extract these from a, a high throughput pooled SAR analysis. So that's really exciting to us. And then, and finally, I want to dwell on, um, I think we've got a bit of time, to uh, one of our key leading drug discovery targets. So out of our campaign in E3 space, we uncovered um, one particular uh, protein I sequence with a really high degree of activity for which we subsequently mapped uh, the target in an unambiguous fashion using yeast 2 hybrid, similarly to how I described earlier. Again, this was a structurally enabled, fortunately, by others in so much as we had a sequence, uh, sorry, a, a set of data that could describe the interaction surface. And on that basis, we predicted uh, two key bulky residues uh, in the core of the, of the protein I sequence, which would be required for the activity, or in, in this case, required for binding to the E3 ligase. Um, and we were able to directly corroborate that in a high throughput pooled fashion using these systematic libraries that we developed. Um, 
Here I'm showing the data where these mutagenesis events, alanine mutations on these two residues and in the truncation, which encompasses those two residues, uh, which ablate the activity of this protein I sequence really quite efficiently. So that's a really quick, clear indication, not just of the on-target activity, validating, for example, the yeast hybrid, data, yeast hybrid data directly, but also, much more importantly for us, gives us a starting point for the small molecule development in that we can start to learn what are the required interaction surfaces for that binding to occur and the liganding of that ultimately small molecule as we turn it into a proton. So what are we going to try and do next? Um, what we've shown so far is that we can discover novel E3 ligands. Uh, we have many of them. A toolkit, I think, is a good way of describing it. And now we can start to branch those out into a, a bona fide uh, bifunctional molecules against any given uh, target of our choice. And the way we would do that is, is briefly summarized on this slide. We have this uh, big toolkit of potentially novel new uh, E3 ligands, and we can append that in a novel library. And these will require to be quite large, so we need high, uh, um, high, high fidelity synthesis to up to 300 base pairs in some cases. Uh, where the other end of that ligand, or that molecule rather, is the warhead. That can be uh, a known warhead. There are many good descriptions of war peptide-based warheads for interesting targets available already. Or it can be a, a, a series, a library effectively, of novel uh, interactome-inspired warheads that we can actually query in an experimental fashion. And the exciting thing for us about this is that that is a matrix-based experiment. We've got two ends of a molecule, both of which are variable, and we get the opportunity with our high throughput uh, pool screening system to explore the efficiency of de degradation of that key uh, target molecule uh, in a really, really high throughput fashion. So what is delivered by such a screen uh, that we've already started doing now is a pre-optimized heterobiofunctional molecule. And that overcomes a lot of the bottlenecks in the protax space since what is often the, uh, the big problem in this area is the development of molecules which are simultaneously optimized because often there's a known warhead, and of course there are known uh, E3 ligand molecules as well for, for BHL and other, and other uh, terrible and other, type other targets. But sticking those two things together often yields uh, an inactive molecule, and you need to re-optimize in all sorts of complicated ways to actually gain the activity of the protag. So what we hope our systematic peptide-based uh, uh, screen can, can actually deliver is a pre-optimized system, either directly as a peptide protag, which could be therapeutic, uh, or as a conversion starting point for a small molecule development. So that's where we'll be going next, uh, enabled by the libraries that we develop, and we're really excited about that. Okay, so a summary. Um, I've, I've tried to present to you today a very quick uh, run-through of what protein I is and how we're using it with our site seeker technology. We think it's transformative for all sorts of different ways. I hope I've tried to I've been able to illustrate that. And there's some key application areas that I'm trying to uh, draw out as well. Firstly, the ability of protein I to de-orphan novel CRISPR screen hits, something which I think there is a really big need for in the field. And secondly, uh, the, the, our ability to repurpose the SiteSeeker system to discover novel protein-like molecules in a really systematic way. So protein is exciting for us. Um, I think that uh, leads me to thank um, the, the fantastic team at Foremost, uh, Dan, as, as Chris has said, in Cambridge UK, the Bay Brown campus, a really talented group of scientists, an exciting place to work. Uh, and with that, I can uh, thank you and hand over to Chris and happy to answer any questions. And thank you very much. That was a really interesting talk, and it's uh, it's fascinating to hear about this this approach. Um, I wonder if I might begin with a question. We've got a few coming in, so just a reminder to our, our audience today: if you do have questions for Ben, you can submit those by the Q and A box. Um, I hope you won't mind um, uh, a sort of slightly obvious question for me, knowing your background, which is you know what you to me what you've described today is is that you can with protein I get to some of the same. Uh, real high potential hits as you would with a CRISPR screen, but you get this added upside of of potentially understanding what's what's struggable straight out the gate. So I guess my question would be, would you still need the CRISPR screen at this point, or would you just want to launch straight into a protein ice cream? It's a good question, a very leading question, as I know my background, but thanks, Chris. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's, it is the case that we can deliver not only novel targets, but also, and, and all, uh, but also the, the means to drug them, as I tried to indicate. Uh, and I haven't shown today, but we've also been able to discover targets which have been pre-discovered by CRISPR and sRNA, so a sort of validation of the protein I approach. Um, and in, in the future, you can certainly envisage a time when that is a predominant mechanism to discover new targets. But I think I prefer to position the, the benefits of, of protein I in somewhat more complementary fashions to what is being delivered by CRISPR. CRISPR knockout in particular 
is always going to give you the maximum degree of sensitivity to phenotypic presentation because gene ablation will always be uh, the kind of top end of a phenotype group uh, derived of the loss of any given target. And protein I, whilst uh, it's, it's possible to deliver such a similar phenotype with phenotypic range, it's more likely to mimic what's going to happen in a drug. And that can be an advantage and a disadvantage for the system, depending on how you approach it. And even within the CRISPR space, there are multiple different tools in crispr I and crispr A, and I've always considered those things to be complementary within themselves and, uh, and endorse a, a, a sort of a, 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 a parallel tractor, a multimodal approach, if you like, to using these kind of technologies to discover new drugs. And I position, uh, I think, protein I exactly in amongst those tools, uh, where we stand to benefit from the advantages of what CRISPR can do and the advantages of what protein I can do. Um, I think worth also mentioning that CRISPR delivered um, along with SHRNA, many of the tools for which protein I benefits. Um, and so there we also have to make sure that we um, try to capitalize on all the, the existing infrastructure and what's novel and exciting. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I've demonstrated today that protein is different, uh, complementary, and potentially a next generation approach to doing these kind of experiments. Brilliant. All right, well, I want to dig into some questions from the audience and maybe sort of pepper, pepper them with a few of my own. So um, we have uh, a question from Tim Rand sort of asking about the nature of, of the, the peptides. And I, I guess what I'd like to ask and, and just sort of expand on this. So what Tim's asking is, are, are the peptides expressed in, in a, a protein I scaffolded? So, for example, are they expressed as a loop or are they just a floppy small peptide? Mm. So I, I wonder as well if you could maybe just tell us a little bit more then about the nature of the library itself are, are we talking short peptides long peptides what how how many yeah. peptides uh, yeah perhaps you could just expand on that that's a good question um and yeah apologies if it, if it wasn't clear the, the protein i sequences is, is, is they're dna encoded so they aren't uh, post translation modified by us in a systematic way and they aren't stapled for example but we do obviously enrich our libraries uh, bioinformatically for sequences which have got a high degree of stability uh, uh, have a high propensity to to three-dimensional sense, a stable tertiary structure, so folding and presenting a you know, bona fide three-dimensional shape. Uh, and all of that process goes into each of the libraries that we design. And in terms of the, the length component, that is also programmable. Um, we, in, when we're exploring uh, high diversity, as we call it, where we want to present as much, um, uh, as much uh, complexity and variety of, of shapes with by protein I into cells to interrogate, we tend to use longer sequences, around 46 amino acids. So that, that length was, is crucial to be able to be synthesized, and that's why we ended up working with Twist initially. Um, and that, the reason for that is both because it gives you an advantage in terms of the stability and all those expression components that I described, and also that it, pre it presents diversity even within a single protein I fragment. And that is marked by only a single barcode, so you effectively get more real estate in the screen for less measurement potential. Um, the, the corollary of that is you have to subsequently if you want to go to small molecule chemistry, identify the minimal footprint within that longer peptide fragment. But that's a system we've got relatively well worked out uh, and necessary for all uh, elements of small molecule development downstream. Um, so we are kind of you know, fairly flexible on those things. We have conducted screens with shorter fragment peptides as well, and they deliver uh, different, kinds of diff different kinds of discovery opportunity um, for depending on what we're doing. The protect based studies, for example, there were given, uh, were, were screened with 11 MERS, uh, and that gave us a head start to even getting to four and five more amino acid sequences, as, as, I, um, as I illustrated there with that data. Okay. Um, and then a question uh, from an anonymous person asking about, or, or sort of commenting that, it, uh, that perhaps it can be challenging linking an express peptide to a specific protein target versus perhaps the example you've shown. Um, mm. and, and also making the observation that uh, there might be multiple targets that peptide can bind yeah. to and exactly that do. So they ask, um, is there perhaps an unbiased mass spectrometry based tool that you can use to identify peptide bound target proteins? Yeah, you... absolutely. I think that's a really good question. And um, um, yeah, very, very good observation that the target ID component of the process is crucial and is also um, challenging. And actually what, what's, what's turned out is that there, there is no one sort of panacea for that. We've had a lot of success with the U2 hybrid. But there, that wasn't as valuable in, in say, identifying E3 ligands for, for, sorry, E3 ligases for what we're trying to do in the protax space. And there we're using other approaches like uh, perturbation, CRISPR-based approaches, and uh, maybe as, as uh, sort of alluded to in the question, things like mass spec-driven bioID, so that's proximity-dependent labeling. So there you can express the protein I um, and uh, have it um, 
ad adapted to a, a biotinylating enzyme that can give you the opportunity to find anything that is within a given proximity of the protein I want to express. Advantage of that is it's done in, within the same cell system that you did the screening. Um, so it is hard to identify the targets. You do have to do it in a really detailed and systematic way. And uh, our experience in this instance is that actually you also have to have multiple tools at your disposal to be able to do that adequately. And in terms of the multiple targets question, I think that's a really good question as well. And absolutely, we, have, we, we observe that frequently, that there is some degree of polypharmacology in these spaces. And that, I, I suspect, is probably an advantage to the system overall. But you do need to be mindful of that when it comes to the target idea activity, that you either maintain the, the requisite degree of polypharmacology as you move towards small molecule development, or you identify the critical aspects of it out of a one or two or three potential targets that bind to the protein eye. So yeah, that's absolutely true. And I wonder about if I might ask a somewhat naive question. So obviously one of the things that you spend a lot of time trying to control for when you're doing genetic screening is, is off target sort of effects. But in the context of this technology, is it fair to say that that's not something you need to be worried about because really you're just looking at the, the phenotype and then, um, you know, where it binds come late, comes later. True. In, in, the, in the direct comparison of the, uh, the uh, analogous screen with, say, CRISPR shRNA, you don't have the same worry about yeah. the protein I driving some off-target phenomena. You do nevertheless still have off-target or false positives um, phenomena from your screen, but they're more systematic associated with the assay that you're looking at. Say you have mm. a protein I which um, uh, inhibits translation at a, a fundamental level where actually you're looking for the selective silencing of, of a particular function within a particular uh, protein or, or, or pathway. So there are still experimental, um, um, I guess, off-target, if one of a better phrase, mm. uh, features that you have to control for and make sure you survey. But yeah, that, that aspect of um, gene editing, SHRNA, having potential unknown uh, activity within cells on an individual sequence level we don't necessarily have to contend with that to the same extent. Understood. So um, one thing uh, that is sort of, uh, so just a few more audience questions from Christian. Is it possible to target cell membrane proteins using, uh, using this approach? It's a really good question. We believe it is, uh, we, we, and, but we haven't yet conducted a screen which systematically looks to do that. And that's, that applies to uh, other organelles and compartments as well. Um, you can enrich uh, selectively by, by encoding uh, appropriate sequences to the protein eyes and having that uh, in, introduced as part of the, the library um, process. Um, and you could do that in a way which uh, biased uh, protein eye activity around um, cell membrane targets. Um, by the way, you design the library or the way you append certain functional sequences to it. But we haven't done that in a systematic way. Uh, we have no reason to think that the protein eye that we're identifying would not uh, functionally interrogate or interact with uh, membrane targets, uh, obviously intracellularly, but we haven't identified a systematic uh, bias for that or in fact, you know, deliberately tried to achieve that. Mm. Um, another question from our audience. So is it possible to look for react? So, so we, the, the, the example you showed was in isogenic cell lines uh, using, mm. in this case, the KRAS uh, uh, G12V, I think it was. Uh, but they're asking, uh, is it possible to look at reactivation of function, for example, in a, in a P53 null cell line, uh, where you could functionally activate or, or switch? Uh, yeah. Yeah, switch actually, that's a, that's a really good question. And uh, something that's, again, a, a nice sort of um, a nice a point to draw on the distinction between protein I um, from other sort of loss of function technologies. In principle, there's no particular reason why a protein I would be selectively um, drive, uh, the library, for example, would be more likely to drive loss of function other than the sort of intuitively obvious, easier, it's easier to interfere with something than it is to cause activation. Mm. But actually protein I may be as distinct from other approaches, does have a greater likelihood to drive activation of the process from a sort of fundamental perspective. And we have conducted campaigns like that in autophagy, where we're selectively looking to induce autophagy, so cause an activation. And whilst that might be via inhibition of a inhibiting component, uh, there's also a possibility for causing gain of function directly on the target, or, albeit slightly less, um, less likely. So yeah, in principle, that feature is true. In the case of the P53, you're probably actually looking for death anyway, and interfering with something via, in a loss mm. of function fashion would be sufficient. Uh, and so yes, if the assay can be configured to explore uh, dependency on p53 then yeah we can conduct a screen on protein i for it um so questions still coming in ben so i'll, I'll keep going so uh, somewhat um 
a timely question from from Philip Cock uh, asking the question: um, Do you know of any examples of protein I being used in the field of infectious disease? Uh, so, for example, using it um, to look at uh, or target pathogens. Um, yes, we have some of our some nascent programs of our own in that space. Um, the tricky thing there is always on the cell system. Um, so the, the tools that we use are optimized for working in mammalian cell system. So you could configure an infection uh, on the mammalian cell system if you had the appropriate way to measure um, the, the relevant aspects of that uh, process in, in, a, in, a, in a mammalian cell system, which uh, you want to do it in, then yeah, we could probably configure a screen to do it that way. Interfere with the pathogen function itself outside of the context of uh, the host. Um, we haven't explored, um, but in principle, it could be adapted to that. The tools might be mm -hmm. slightly different. Um, you know, the lentiviral approach would be probably not necessarily directly translatable, but I think you could probably find uh, equivalent tools that would do the same job. Um, and so uh, another anonymous question, and I guess this is uh, sort of, again, you, there might be some parallels between what's sort of happening in the CRISPR screening field at the moment. So there we're starting to see people explore um, dual screens where they're, you know, co uh, tran transfecting or co-infecting with two guides at the same time. So question here from our attendee is, can you look at two or more peptide sequences expressed in a single cell? at the same time, potentially it's in this case for the same target or mm -hmm. uh, for different targets. Have you, have you, and I guess that sort of pertains to, you know, what's the sort of multiplicity of infection of your mm. approach? Uh, you know, in so yeah, you could do it deliberately in an, in an unmonitored way by using a uh, high multiplicity of infection, but we, we, we tend to control that very tightly. It's more important for us, maybe even in some other technologies to have that under, uh, under tight linen and, and to try to minimize the frequency of any, uh, dual infection events, but to do it in a program fashion, so to express deliberately in a in a in a in a curated way, two unique protein I simultaneously is absolutely possible. And actually, in some regards, it will be. Although we haven't done it yet, it's, we have it as, as one of our many ambitions. Um, it will be easier uh, when we do it uh, than the experience of doing it with CRISPR, where you have much more shared sequence in the trade. Well, until we get to Cas12 and everything else. Um, but generally speaking, we won't have quite the same level of sort of recombination between the shared sequence components of the, of the, of the infrastructure. So we probably will be able to overcome some of those problems more quickly with protein I. Um, we haven't done it yet because the system that we use is already vastly complex. And uh, in case I didn't mention it, the, the libraries for, for our high diversity analyses are, you know, a million and a half large at least. And so they're sort of an order of magnitude bigger than most other pool screening technologies. And so to add a second layer of complexity out of that, yeah, is mm. beyond uh, our, our current um, cell biology infrastructure. <laughs> oh, no, understood. Understood. <laughs> um, so question from uh, Nicola. Uh, great talk, Ben. Uh, could you please elaborate more on the reason why your approach has the potential to overcome resistance to current protax? So I don't know if ah, that's... It's a good question. Good. Yeah. Sorry if I didn't um, go into that in detail. I think the reasoning behind that is about, it, it's actually slightly difficult to explain it, it without being a bit deliberately vague about it. It's because of the nature of our targets that we've discovered. So the E3 ligases that we've identified fall uh, throughout the E3 complex. That is to say that they're not necessarily in the catalytic component. Um, they, they represent uh, adapter molecules, scullin, scaffold, everything uh, from the entire complex, which as you know, um, is often uh, quite multi-component ternary pros, uh, complex. And that, because of the nature of the way we're interfering with them, has the opportunity to overcome what has been observed so far in, say, the BET type uh, protax, where the resistance occurred through quite well described mechanisms. So, by that uh, notion, we have the opportunity to overcome the existing resistance. So, by cutting out the middleman effectively and going directly to a core component of the E3 ligase, we think we'll have some opportunity. I guess the other slightly more glib um, reason we think we're quite hopeful about that is that um, we have a toolbox. So the toolbox is what we, we started the screening process for and what we think that the, screen, the, the field of protax is in dire need of, which is more, more E3 ligases that can be adequately uh, targeted by novel ligands. And if mm. you have that, then of course you have the opportunity to develop um, completely different kinds of degradation process, which should obviously not be subject to the same uh, mechanisms of resistance. That's what yeah. I mean by that. Right, well... We're, I think that leads me nicely to perhaps a, a final question. Um, and uh, just to, you, you mentioned this E3 toolbox and uh, at the time when you were talking about it, you said this was something that ultimately uh, you guys want to sort of build and, and, and make available to the, 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 uh, the scientists interested. So if someone's watching this and they're interested in 
you know, accessing your E3 toolbox, what, how, how can they go about doing that? And how can they work with Foremost or, or gain access yeah. to the E3 toolbox? That's, that's a really good question. Um, the, <laughs> the answer is uh, they're currently ours <laughs> and so we're not sharing them. But the reality is um, that, you know, we, we, we have a, a very different sort of philosophy at Foremost than most of the drug discovery companies. We are um, already engaged in multiple different collaborative campaigns and we seek to uh, forge alliances wherever we think there's mutually beneficial reason to do so. And in this space in particular, we think that there is an opportunity to explore partnerships. And that's how we would be looking to, to develop or, or to make, make available these particular tools. And actually, generally speaking, in the project night space. Uh, we're happy and we already have um, um, forged lots of um, good alliances with major farmers. And we look to do that more and more because we recognize that we are the experts in protein i We've got a lot of expertise in some disease areas, but of course not all of them. And as I tried to indicate um, with the slides today, there are lots and lots of things you could use a protein i technology for. And similarly, lots and lots of things we could use our um, E3 ligand library for as well. So in that space, the best way we hope to, to capitalize on this is by uh, structured collaborations um, with the appropriate people who've got the tools that we don't have that can make it a complementary process for us. Mm. Um, so I think that's the best answer yeah. I can give there, Chris. Well, yeah, and I think I think that's probably a great point at which to leave things. So um, we're, we've sort of done about 15 minutes of questions there. And I hope what you've taken from this is that, uh, you know, if you if you want to learn more about what Foremost are doing or potentially collaborate with them, then you can reach out to to Ben and the team there at Foremost. Then what's the, uh, the website address that they can reach you at? Uh, foremost.com. Straightforward Perfect. enough, I think. Okay. And if you're interested to know more about Twist Oligo Pools, uh, the like, uh, similar to which are, are powering uh, the Protein Eye platform at Foremost, then you can find more about those on our website. Uh, if I'm sorry we weren't able to answer quite all the questions today. They're still coming in, but uh, I think we're going to have to draw a line under it. But we will try to follow up with you individually if you've given us your name, or if you would like to follow up with us, you can do so at, at Foremost or, or at Twist. Uh, please do take a few moments to fill in the survey after we finish and give us some feedback. We'd be delighted to hear what you, what you found useful for this. And hopefully we'll see you at the next webinar. Ben, thank you so much for talking for us today. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon.